All right, let's get started for today. Um, your homework two was due last night, but if you still have late days, you can keep working on it just a little bit longer. Um, then let's see. Your homework three will go out later today, late tonight probably, which we'll be doing two weeks from yesterday. After which you only have one homework left, so pretty far along in the class. Um, it is also time to start thinking about your final projects. So um, start thinking about what you want to do. Look at the guidelines on the web page. Essentially want you to do some interesting research, ideally. The beginning of a research project, some initial signs of life of something new, or maybe already far along with something, kind of tied into that, um, related to the class. You'll have a deadline soon to submit a proposal through Google Docs. We'll comment on that. We'll go back and forth with you and at some point say that your proposal is approved, at which point you can get going. You'll have a milestone a month or so from now in the final delivery, which will be a, a write-up and a recorded presentation at the end of the semester. Um, and yeah, take advantage of office hours to come brainstorm ideas for your projects if you're not sure what to do. It's often hard for us to just propose something, but once you come with even a rough idea of your own, it's easy for us to kind of brainstorm together with you around those ideas. Any questions on logistics? Okay, well, today we're going to look at diffusion models. This was not part of the class four years ago. It didn't exist uh, four years ago. Uh, the, the paper uh, Jonathan Ho wrote uh, was written, I guess, less than four years ago. Um, it's pretty exciting because in some sense almost everything that happened in the last four years, at least in the image space, seems to have been involving diffusion models, uh, either just diffusion models or other things combined with diffusion models. So, um, here's one of the things that I uh, really enjoyed. When OpenEyes DALI 2 came out, which is now a couple years ago, it was possible to start giving prompts and it would then generate art for you. So, for example, here, a masterful oil painting, a Persian exotic cat discovering their astounding crypto losses while checking their phone. Okay, that's the prompt. You feed it into the uh, neural network, the diffusion model, and out comes a beautiful artistic rendering of the prompt. And by the way, the little color scheme at the bottom right, that's a signature that it's a, a dolly generated image. Now, if you're active in AI at all, then probably you recently heard about this thing called Sora, which just came out last week. It's a diffusion model. Not all the details are available, but it's a diffusion model that is capable of um, generating full videos from descriptions. So in this case, beautiful snowy Tokyo. Um, oops, I wanted to play that instead of go to the next line. Let's see if that can work. Beautiful snowy Tokyo city is bustling. The camera moves through the bustling city street, following several people enjoying the beautiful snowy weather and shopping at nearby stalls. Gorgeous sakura petals are flying through the wind along with snowflakes. And so I watched this video. It's very hard to spot anything that's off about it. Now, maybe if you look at the very detailed aspects of it, you'll find some things that are off. But from a quick glance, this looks like just a drone video shot behind a couple walking in Tokyo, but actually it's just made up by AI. That's how good these models have become. Uh, Philip told me this was one of his favorites. Um, reflections in the window of a train traveling through the Tokyo suburbs. That's what you ask for. And then here's what you get. Um, Rendering reflections on the window, and when it goes dark, you see more detail of the person that's standing in front of the window. It's pretty amazing. It captures all those aspects of what video or real-world perception would be like. Um, here's another one. A cat waking up its sleeping owner demanding breakfast. The owner tries to ignore the cat, but the cat tries new tactics, and finally the owner pulls out a secret stash of treats from under the pillow to hold the cat off a little longer. Okay, let's see what happens here. By the way, this is one that they published as one where not everything looks as perfect to give people a sense of what might still not be fully working. Uh, so keep a close eye on what's actually happening. It's like there's a third arm emerging under the sheets, but I mean, 
other than that, it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, that one moment was, of course, a little bit off, but that's also, you know, they're sharing it. They could have cherry-picked and left this one out, but they're actually sharing it to show where the opportunities for improvement still are. And then uh, another one that they shared to show opportunities for improvements, again, long caption, in this case, five gray wolf pups. Is it really five? Looks like three, but now it's four, now it's five. Um, now, I mean, now, in the real world, that's hard to pull off, but in a movie, you can imagine that this could happen where there's like, these puppies are just sprouting out of nowhere and uh, doing something. Um, so obviously there are some limitations to, to the realism. To be fair, a lot of videos online are made in a way that there are limitations to the realism of these videos. They could not happen in the real world. So um, I think unless you truly filter videos for realism, you might always end up with something like this if you're not, if you're not careful. But um, again, it's one that they share to show there is still room for improvement. It's not game over just yet. Um, you can do this with robots too. So here, the, the previous ones were from OpenAI Sora system, uh, and that project was led by um, Bill Peeves and Tim Brooks, who just graduated with their PhD from Berkeley uh, less than a year ago. Uh, we're already working on diffusion models for video generation at Berkeley, but of course didn't have the amount of compute, amount of data, annotated data available to do this kind of you know leap forward that is possible with the resources OpenAI offer them. Now. Here's uh, one done by another Berkeley student, Cherry Yang, and um, what you'll see here, I mean, if you follow the discussion on Sora online, you'll see like, oh, does it really learn about physics? It's like not realistic, realistic, and so forth. Here it's specifically trained to include a lot of robotics data. And so it's interesting now, if you include a lot of robotics data, manipulation data, what might happen? And do you start getting some realism that maybe could help robots think through the consequences of their actions? And so, this is a sequence of videos. So it starts with a frame, then make the request put can on top. Then a new request can be made, close bottom drawer, and so forth. So it's a sequence of commands made. As this, is, this video uh, gets generated in, in little chunks. Um, but what you see is actually it follows the rules. I and mean, it opens the drawer, it pulls it out. It doesn't just open it in an unexpected way. Um, and so when it moves an object, the robot actually has to go there grasp the object to then put it where it wants to put it. Um, so when you watch all of this, sure, some little details aren't exactly picture perfect. It's not trained with a you know super large model the way that Sora was trained. So the, there's more artifacts, but the gist of this model knowing how to do a task like grabbing an object, opening a drawer, closing a drawer, putting something in a drawer, it's actually captured in this model. So it's pretty interesting that this is actually uh, a real possibility now. Okay, so today's lecture will consist of uh, two components. First, I'll go over some of the basics, the history of diffusion models, um, which I think often by seeing the history of how things came together, it can give you an understanding of maybe where things are headed, more so than just seeing a snapshot of what is the latest and greatest uh, model. Um, it can also teach you something about how maybe a new area could emerge and what, what the steps could be. Um, from there, Wilson and Kevin will dive a lot deeper on some of the aspects of the latest and greatest models and what matters to make them work. And as you know, you'll get a homework on diffusion models uh, released two weeks uh, from today to, to dive even deeper yourself. Okay, so, um, state of affairs of this class actually right now, as well as the field of generative models in 2020 for visual generation, there were autoaggressive models, Flow models, latent variable models, GANs. GANs give the most realistic images, but they have lots of bells and whistles, and they struggle with truly covering what's in the data distribution. Often you get high quality. When you look at an individual image basis, when you look at the corpus of things generated, it feels too narrow in what it's uh, covering. Income, the motivation to work on something new at the time for uh, Jonathan Ho, uh, PhD student at Berkeley at the time, namely, uh, diffusion models. So obviously there was work before this and I'll highlight some of the work that was before this work um, that motivated motivate us to go in this direction once I've explained what we did here. Um, but I'll explain this paper in a bit of detail to give you a foundation for everything that's coming in this class and then uh, we'll work from there. So 
This is uh, what sometimes the first generation of denoising diffusion probabilistic models could do. Um, these were state-of-the-art results at the time, um, as good as GANs were capable of going, doing. I mean, maybe GANs could do slightly higher resolution still at the time, but it was clear that this was getting towards the same level of quality that GANs were getting at that time, and GANs had had 10 years of development, and this had essentially, you know, very little development, tiny amount of development in comparison. Um, and by the way, not just the quality uh, is what we looked at to evaluate this, but also if you look at the details of the diversity of things generated, it was much better diversity than GANs could do. So it, had, it was going towards same level of quality while having much better diversity, better coverage of what's in the data in some sense. So it was clear that there was a high potential there. What's the model uh, that was proposed in this paper? Um, turns out diffusion models has many ways to think of them, many valid interpretations. Um, that's part of what complicates it because some paper might use a new architecture but use one in way of interpreting diffusion models with one type of notation, another paper, use a different interpretation, different notation, and then to use another architecture. And actually, you could use both improvements together, but it's just, you know, there's so many ways to think about them. In some way, the, I think the simplest way to think of them, or one of the simplest ways to think of them is that they are just denoisers. So the way you train these models is you have an image, x0, you add, in this case, Gaussian noise to it at the pixel level, step by step, and you try to learn a model that goes in the opposite direction, removes the noise. The reason you, that might be an interesting thing to do is because if you can do this really well, then you can start with just a pure noise image and it'll somehow turn it into a realistic image if it's doing a good job. Or if you had maybe a low quality image, you could turn it into a high quality image because you could denoise that low quality image. If you look at this model, um, in some sense, this thing here is very similar to what we call Z in the VAE in GAN. It's just a very special kind of latent space. The latent space here is this like same size as the original image in this case. Again, these things will change as we look at more advanced diffusion models. But same size as the original image. And it's just pure Gaussian noise. And we can actually guarantee that if we do enough steps, of adding Gaussian noise that we will turn the distribution of Z's into a Gaussian distribution. You add enough Gaussian noise and the way it's done, adding the Gaussian noise, which is the, the Q steps here, going right to left, is you effectively shrink the image, you scale it down, let's say multiply by 0 0.9 all the pixel values, shrink them towards zero, and then add Gaussian noise. You also center the image around zero, so you have a values from negative one to plus one, let's say, for your pixel values, and then your original sh keeps shrinking away while you keep adding Gaussian noise. That's how you go from right to left. So the right to left path is highly trivial. Nothing to be learned. You could think it as a good thing, bad thing, but nothing to be learned, just noise, 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 and on the end, you get a Gaussian uh, distribution. To go the other way is harder and has to be learned. So we have to learn a model that can recover xt minus one given xt, and assuming the steps are small, you can actually assume that the correct way to go back is to actually also model it as a Gaussian in the opposite direction, um, where you now have to learn to predict the mean and the variance of that Gaussian. So the steps are small enough, this is not, uh, this is not a real approximation, it's, it's correct. Of course, you need to learn the mu theta and the sigma theta to make sure it matches up with uh, what's in your data. So this view on things is conceptually relatively straightforward. Um, but, and then in principle, you could just train a model that has a, you could even maybe use a sigma as a hyperparameter and just train a model from mu thetas that predict a slightly denoised version from your uh, previous um, noisy image. The way it's actually set up is a little different. In some sense, it's simplified. Um, training time, you sample an image. Then you sample a time step, you sample Gaussian noise, and then you create a image with noise added to it. X here is your original image, you're scaling it down, and then you're adding Gaussian noise here. This alpha t, the larger it is, the closer to one, the more noisy your result will be. And essentially there's a scheme here where depending on the time that you sample, 
you'll end up with a very noisy image if your time is high, which is you're very far in the diffusion process, or if your time is very small, then it's just a little bit of noise added to the image. And what you're supposed to do then is to take in this noisy image. This thing here is just your noisy image, as well as the time step of diffusion. So you're essentially told there was this much diffusion happening to achieve this image, this noisy image. Now learn a neural network, epsilon theta, that recovers the noise that was applied. That's conceptually equivalent to recovering the original image. Because once you recover the noise that was applied, you can subtract it out from the noisy image and get the original image. And so you can actually also formulate it in a way where you say, I want to recover the original image. But this is the formulation used here. We're going to recover um, the noise that was applied. And we'll also get into some specifics about why one might be better than the other later in lecture when we dive deeper. Um, but for now, let's assume we just try to train a neural network that recovers the noise that was applied from looking at the noisy image. Um, it turns out, if you look at the details of the derivation and so forth, that this epsilon theta is a scaled version of the grad log p theta x. What is this p theta x? This is the distribution we're learning. We don't have direct access to it. Really, all we have is this sample that turns noise into um, images. But under the hood, there is a corresponding distribution, p theta x. It's set up that way. Um, and we never directly evaluated, but it turns out that this epsilon theta is essentially trying to recover this. What is that quantity? It's saying, move my x into the direction that under my model makes x more likely. So let's say it's just a simple, simple Gaussian, right? And your x-axis and your x is sitting here. And you say, oh, well, move x a bit this way because it's higher over here. Now, this is in high dimensional image space, obviously, it's a more complicated picture to draw. But the notion is that locally you say, how can I make my image more likely under my model? And that's what's um, done by epsilon theta once it's trained well. And so if we then look at the sampling, um, multiple time steps, though in principle you could do it with, with one time step, um, you take your current xt and you calculate the direction in which to step to denoise it a little bit. And then you, you essentially make that correction. And that's what you have here. And if it's not your final step yet, you also add some Gaussian noise to it. That's to stay within distribution of how things were trained. So in the next step, you have a within distribution noisy image for which you can again apply the uh, <coughs> epsilon theta calculation to step in the right direction and repeat. So if you look at this interpretation here, it's really saying every step along the way when I'm sampling, I'm trying to nudge my current image to be a more likely image under my learned distribution and add some noise to stay on course for the process with, it, with which I have been training so that the next step also succeeds. This process here is actually called, um, the whole process is called Langevin sampling. And it's actually a way to correctly sample from this distribution p theta of x. So it's a, it's a justifiably correct way to do this. So in some sense, that's all there is to it. I mean, there's a lot more to it, obviously, because there's many more years of work and many breakthroughs that have happened since this paper. But in some sense, this is all there is to it. You learn to identify the noise that was applied, and then later, you use the ability that you learned that to take Naji image in a better and better uh, situation. One way to think of this is that imagine your uh, images live on some kind of manifold and uh, your noise is here, which is off the manifold. It doesn't look realistic at all. What you're really trying to do is bump this thing step by step back onto the manifold of realistic images. That's what's happening under the hood, or at least one interpretation of what's happening. Now, if you check the paper, there's a long derivation there. I'm not going to step through it. Um, but essentially, you can start from this um, model that we drew on top. Say that what we're doing is we're essentially maximizing the log likelihood under that model of our data. 
And then we use the variational lower bound, introduce the variational distribution Q, which happens to be fixed in this case, but the same one we used for VAE. So you can multiply, divide by it, swap the order of the log and the expectation, and it becomes a bound. And then you get um, the objective that's being optimized. Then if you reshuffle it a bit to reduce the variance, you get this thing over here, which in turn leads to the algorithm I showed you. Don't worry about it too much, um, but you can go read. There's a bunch of papers that get into a lot of details about how to exactly tie it to um, likelihood objectives. Here I'm going to give you a bit of detail. The reason I'm giving this is to give you a sense of what in this 2020 paper was already there as a starting point to understand how things have changed since then. The backbone was same as Pixel CNN++, which we covered uh, last week. Um, so a unit based on a wide ResNet. Okay, so there's a ConfNet um, that um, is architecture that has a wide ResNet, and there's a unit architecture, which means essentially in a unit you go from high res, U shape is this, not sample, but learned, I guess, reduce resolution, go into feature space, and come back out on the other side with hopefully a better version of the image. It could be a segmentation map of the image. It could be a denoised image. That's how units are set up. And the way, the reason they're drawn this way is because typically you don't just try to go from here to here, but you also get the information across. So essentially get the deeper semantic understanding coming from the bottom, and then the de details that were maybe lost come in from the side to help you reconstruct what you need at your current level in the reconstruction of the image on the right. Um, some normalization scheme uh, that was considered weight normalization uh, replaced with group normalization. Um, 33 by 32 models, uh, as you go through the unit, there were four steps, so one, two, three, four, I actually got it right. Um, for the 256 by 256, there were six such steps of going to lower resolution and coming back out. All models have two convolutional residual blocks per resolution level and self attention blocks at the 16 by 16 resolution. So at the bottom here, well, at the 16 by 16, it doesn't have to be the bottom. I think it would be here. It would be an attention uh, block, so a transformer effectively living there to help, I guess, do some more complicated processing. Diffusion time T, which is conditioned on as you train, right? How much do I need to uh, denoise this thing? Uh, sinusoidal position embedding encoding, just like is often used with transformers. The CFR 10 model, 35.7 million parameters, then 114 million for Elson and Celeb AHQ, and then 256 um, for the largest model train. You'll see that some of the later models are only like single digit billion. So this paper was already kind of not exactly single digit billion model, but pretty close to it. Um, what comes out is, in this case, it has great diversity of faces. This is a train on a, a face data set. It's based on celebrities, so it's kind of matching the diversity of whatever celebrities tend to look like. Um, obviously, if you follow the news, Google have made some all kind of modification on their image generation to, to skew it in various ways that are not in the data, per se. Um, this was just straight up trained, no, no manipulation, just whatever is in the data, uh, you know, learn, learn to generate things similar to the data. Bedrooms, churches, all generated really well. Uh, diversity, reflecting the diversity in the data. Um, we look at the scores. Remember, inception score and FID. Um, inception score was how clearly do things belong to a class, because that's a good sign of having a, created a very clear image. Um, ours, this is the denoising diffusion probabilistic models. 9.46, actually second highest among the unconditional models. Only the most advanced GAN was better at the time. And then FID, which also measures the diversity, how well you cover the things in the data, um, much better than anything else that was trained unconditionally. So a great sign of the potential of these models to cover a distribution that has a wider spread. You can interpolate with these. The way you do it is you take two images, you apply noise to it, like a certain number of time steps of noise, and at that point, you then literally average the two noised images and denoise them back out. Um, 
depending on how far you are in, you'll get different things. So for example, these are the, these and these are the source images. Then next to it, the reconstructions. The reconstructions give you a sense of, I go fully into noise and come back. How good is my diffusion model at recovering the original? It's actually pretty good. Um, it's also give you an upper bound, how good the interpolations are, could possibly be, because other information is lost about the original image. Um, but then when you look at um, the, um, the interpolations, you see that indeed it looks a lot still like this person starts edging over to the woman on the left, and here's something in between, and here it's starting to look a lot, a lot more like the woman on the left. And so there's a gradual transition um, from one to the other. It says 500 time steps. I think we had trained with a thousand time steps, which means that you only halfway bring it to um, the full noise image rather than all the way. Um, the reason for that, we do a comparison here. If you have two images that you're comparing uh, or interpolating, this man on the left and this woman on the right, if you do zero steps of diffusion, you're just averaging. So you can see what's happening here is just pixel averaging, not much is happening except for an image that kind of doesn't fully make sense. If you do a whole lot of steps, you go all the way to your Gaussian distribution, um, well, you can actually look right here. At 500, we still get the original reconstructed, but beyond 500, we start losing even the original. We make the image so noisy that when we diffuse back out, we don't get the original back, and so the information was lost about who was there. And so this is kind of the, the natural way to choose that cutoff is to say, hey, I need to still be able to recover my original, otherwise I'm not going to interpolation. And so beyond here, it's just not going to work very well. And actually, if you go all the way, you see, oh, we had a great diversity in some sense of uh, faces generated, but it's nothing to do with interpolating at that point. This is just pure noise that we're recovering from, nothing to do with the original images. Okay, um, you can actually go look at the paper for more details, but there's a, a way you can think of diffusion models as effectively being a generalization of autoaggressive models. How so? Autoaggressive models, imagine autoaggressive model as you have your image, you removed the bottom right pixel, then you move the pixel next to that, you remove the next one. Think of instead of adding Gaussian noise, you're just blanking out one pixel at a time, so the entire image is blanked out. It's not exactly the same as adding Gaussian noise, obviously there's a difference, but you could think of that as a possible process. And then the reverse process would be what an autoaggressive model is doing. It's filling it back in one pixel at a time. So a diffusion model is in some sense doing this in a generalized coordinate space, and it's also doing it in a randomized way. It's randomly in certain directions, erasing information by adding noise, and gradually over time getting to a completely erased image and then learns to go back uh, to the original image. Diffusion model, of course, has to be as deep as the number of pixels for that analogy to truly hold true, but I think in the more abstract level, um, it, it holds true no matter what. Now you might wonder, why did Jonathan uh, Ho at the time come to me and say, I wanna work on diffusion models? Um, it didn't come out of nowhere. So he'd been, he of course knew that GANs were quite uh, constrained in terms of the ability to be uh, cover, cover multimodal distributions, struggling with that. Um, and so he had seen these two papers especially. Um, this one here by Sol Dickstein and collaborators from 2015, five years before that moment, so it's been sitting there, largely ignored by most people, um, sitting there for five years at the time, actually introduced diffusion models from a thermodynamics perspective. And it has essentially the same ideas. I mean, didn't get all the details right to get the same level of, um, of generations happening, but at a high level had the essential ideas. Then in parallel, Jonathan had seen that um, Young Song and Stefano Ehrman um, at Stanford had gotten some really good image generation by um, essentially running Langevin dynamics sampling on grad log PX and by directly learning a model that can predict the grad log PX, which is what you need for the Langevin sampling. And so Jonathan realized that the, well, thought that there could be a very strong connection between these two works. And while this one 
And Jonathan's perspective introduced it in something in a more, I guess, clean way to work from. This one here on the right was getting already quite strong results in terms of image generation. And then he investigated how to, to bring them both together. And that led to the, to the paper we wrote. Okay, so from here, a quick, a quick run through of um, what happened from there. Then OpenAI wrote a paper, um, Diffusion Models Beat GANs on Image Synthesis. Uh, the title says what they were trying to get across. Um, it was beating them now, not just on diversity, which the original paper already did, but also on individual image quality. When they would ask people, can you rate which qualities you like better, um, it's better. Um, selected samples from their best image net 512 by 512 model. Um, this is, the, you know, really good image generation that is uh, emerging here. Um, some things they looked at, they would learn the variance. In Jonathan's paper, it was a hyperparameter that was tuned. In their paper, the variance of the um, process was learned. Um, and they also you looked at the deterministic sample, which we'll talk about more later, um, which is both variants are, are still in consideration today. They made some architecture improvements, increasing the depth versus the width, um, increasing the number of attention heads, use attention not just at the 16 by 16, but also at the 32 by 32 and 8 by 8. At the end of this lecture today, you'll hear of models that only use attention and, and no convolutions anymore. The trend, the trend is going that way here already. Um, began residual block for upsampling and downsampling the activations. Um, Rescaling residual connections with a factor one over square root two. So little things that can help. Um, they introduced something called classifier guidance. So they said, because we want to have images that look realistic, and we measure that by looking at the classifier score, if something is belonging to a certain class or not, why not provide some guidance? And um, train a classifier that classifies onto the classification level, because these unsupervised learning data sets are often actually labeled. Uh, we just use them as unsupervised, but why not use also the label uh, for once? And note that this classifier has to be trained on noisy images. You need to learn to classify the noised images just as well as real images. And then guided. You take the gradient with respect to XT that makes the image not just more likely as an image, right? Before we were saying, oh, it, we're here, we need to denoise, get back into the manifold. Now it's saying, oh, actually, you know, there's this many manifolds in some sense, and actually, this is the class label we want, so we need to somehow drift over here. And so we get an extra term for that to make it maximally belong to that class. So we have, in some sense, every step of the sampling is what we had, which is a noisy image, then a weighted contribution of the, this is the grad log PX term, and then a weighted version of the grad log py given x. Yes, question? It looks like from one of the previous slides, like when you inject noise, there's a threshold where you cannot like denoise anymore. Mm -hmm. So it actually works when you inject special and how can you train a classifier on a noisy image if you have destroyed the whole information? Yeah, so you might end up wasting some time or you might tune that a little bit. Um, yeah. And so these are the um, comparisons they did. Big GAN Deep, the biggest big GAN model on the left. Um, this diffusion model in the middle, and then training set on the right. The thing to pay attention to, for example, if we look especially at this set over here, is that big GAN generates these flamingos all in pretty much the same configuration. It's a bunch of flamingos together seen from far away. Whereas the data set has them in all kinds of configurations. So clearly Big GAN collapsed onto a specific mode for the generation, whereas the diffusion model doesn't have that issue. Okay, now this classifier guidance helps generate more realistic images, um, but now we need to train this additional classifier, which might cause some challenges. Um, and it's not what people do anymore. Um, then actually, Jonathan Ho and collaborator Tim Salamons introduced a way to get guidance without training an extra classifier called classifier-free diffusion guidance. 
Um, if ever you only see this, it'll look a lot like, hey, some kind of classifier idea, classifier idea is used to guide, but the name comes from the notion that it's trying to contrast it with the classifier guidance. Classifier guidance explicitly use a classifier. Here, we will start with classifier guidance, which is push it towards making the specific class label you want more likely, but then we'll apply Bayes rule. When we apply Bayes rule, we get um, the classifier goes out of it. We get the distribution in the opposite direction. Now the opposite direction distribution, x given y, that's our generator. We're already working on that. We're already training that. So that's great. Our py, that becomes a zero because the grad with respect to x of py doesn't do anything. There's no x in there. And then we have a marginal px. So what we see is by applying Bayes' rule, we can turn this into distributions that we already have because this is a conditional generator and a unconditional generator. So as long as we in parallel train both a conditional and an unconditional generator, we can achieve the same thing as classifier guidance, but without having to train a classifier. Hence the name classifier free guidance. Um, but in terms of, you no, know, mentally, what the signal is, it's still like a classifier. It's still guiding in some sense towards a specific label. It's just doing it, not relying on an explicit classification model, but on a combination of conditional and unconditional model. So you get a nudge. Now, these are the epsilons in our notation earlier. A nudge in the right direction for x conditioned on y and for just x in the unconditional distribution. What does it look like if you're sampling? Um, you go through multiple time steps of going from noise to image. Um, you um, then generate the direction which you're supposed to step. This here is saying, you know, more generate something more like my class conditional sample, which I'm trying to generate, um, but then subtract out this, because remember on this slide, the unconditional is subtracted out. It's pulling you away from being a generic sample and pulling it towards a specific class of sample. So it's subtracted out here. Um, so that's the negative sign here. And then if we're generating a conditional sample, the one here is the term we already have. We're already trying to generate a conditional sample and then there's the weighted correction to that, which is the difference between epsilon theta with C and without C. Okay, um, we update our sample, um, then add noise to it and repeat. Um, the training, uh, during training, you essentially just train a single model because you don't want to be training two neural networks. Um, just sometimes you erase the label from what's being fed into your model. Or another way to think of it is you introduce a n plus one label that you feed in when you want to be uh, unconditional, and then um, that's how you train it. Some of the runs, I mean, some of the updates are unconditional, some of them are unconditional, otherwise everything is the same. Pictorially, um, as you go to um, more and more guidance, you get sharper and sharper concentration around the things that are extremely representative of the specific class. Um, you can also see this here. Um, in some sense, you also get what GANs tend to have. You get a concentration on the most some sort of iconic example of the class, and you get less diversity. So there's a trade-off here. It's a tweaking parameter. How much classifier-free guidance do you really want? The more you put in, the more realism, but also the less diversity in the results that you uh, are obtaining. So this here is non-guided. You get a lot of diversity, but things don't look as like, oh wow, this looks like a you know super clear uh, real dog. And then the more guided you go, um, the more it looks like a real dog, but it's pretty much always the same dog and pretty much the same pose. Here's another example. Um, left is non-guided. The corgi is in all kinds of situations. Um, and then right is guided and it's all these close-ups. Um, depends what you want also. Sometimes maybe you want the result on the right, maybe sometimes you want the result on the left. Um, that might depend on your use case. This is pictorially the thing I just talked about. Remember, inception score effectively measures how realistic something is. And as there is um, sometimes more and more training and more and more guidance happening, it just keeps getting better and better and better, more realistic. Um, 
but then the FID, which also measures diversity and where you want to score low, uh, starts getting worse as you have more and more of this. So very simple way to achieve this classifier guidance is doing classifier free guidance because you only need uh, to still generate a, a generator. You don't need any discriminators, just a conditional and unconditional generator, which you can do in the same model. Okay, what does Glide do? Glide then said, okay, this is great. This diffusion model is kind of work. Why don't we just condition them on text instead of uh, class labels? We have five billion parameters now. Um, for the higher resolution model, an additional super resolution uh, diffusion model. So it's in two stages. First, you learn to go from text to image, 64 by 64. Then you learn to go from 64 by 64 to 256 by 256. Um, the, there's diffusion guidance with caption conditioning now rather than class conditioning. Um, tried clip guided diffusion. What would that mean, clip guided diffusion? It's where you say, oh, I want my thing to look more like something that clip associates with the class that I want. The same kind of gradient idea. Um, didn't work as, as uh, the, I guess, more straightforward thing. This was the first time that it was possible to uh, just kind of generate images of a pretty wide range of things that looked uh, quite good. Um, so exciting to see this, this was becoming possible. Um, you can in-paint with it um, by erasing some things and then um, you know, give a caption because you can then put noise on the thing and then I'll denoise it, satisfying your caption while hopefully, hopefully retaining the rest of the image or you could freeze the rest of the image so it can't really uh, change it. Um, more examples of that, you can incrementally build scenes this way by marking things off as needing to be noised and then denoised with a way to satisfy your caption. So this is the guidance here, right? The classifier free guidance, the difference between the conditional on the caption and unconditional generator uh, nudge. And then clip guidance would be to look at whether clip is happy um, with, the, with the classification label or not, but it happens to not work as well. Um, more samples to show how well this works. Um, from there, there was actually a sequence of models that uh, came out partially in parallel. DALI 1 came out in parallel to Glide, and then DALI 2 and 3 came after that. Um, let's, let's take a look at those. So DALI 1, um, why am I covering it here? Because DALI 2 and DALI 3 are diffusion models. But DALI 1 is not a diffusion model, but I just want to mention that it exists. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Can, can, can we do more and, uh, you know, can we avoid that concentration on specific, you know, images for a specific class? And maybe the way I would think of it is that the way it's been worked around is by doing caption conditioning rather than class conditioning. Because once you have the richness of captions, you kind of can describe in a lot more detail what you want. And hence, now you could argue for the same caption, I still want a lot of diversity. You might want to think about that. Um, but at least for a, um, you know, you have the control to change the image the way you want. And you can create the diversity, hopefully, that you want as you do this. So DALI, uh, DALI 1 was actually just the uh, autoaggressive model. You tokenize the image, you tokenize the text, and you just autoaggressively go from text to image. Um, just a few additional, well, 8,000 additional tokens for each image, uh, possible tokens for each um, image. That's the space. Uh, we covered the VQVAE a couple of lectures ago. It was a variant of that. It uses a Gumball softmax rather than a straight-through grain estimator, which allows you to fully trained against the VA objective, which wasn't exactly true for the VQVA. So it's a bit cleaner in some sense, but it's the same um, idea. Um, and then 250 million text image pairs, and then they did some re-ranking here at the end. So a group of urinals in, is near the trees, and here it is, image is generated. The top row is best of 512 based on clip score. The bottom row is just the best of one. So did you get lucky or not? And so what you see here is um, 
and they studied is the quality of images wasn't perceived as high as the glide model quality of images, but the diversity achieved was higher in, in this model. Um, Translation ability to compose many concepts, and that was one of the exciting things that emerged out of this that people hadn't really seen before. You could say, for example, um, let's see, illustration of a baby hedgehog in a Christmas sweater walking a dog, which probably didn't exist, but it can somehow recombine these ideas into an image that's being generated, and was uh, very exciting to see that possible for the first time. Dolly 2 made essentially um, image generation come of age. Um, the cat example I gave at the beginning was a Dolly 2 example. Um, it came of age, I would say, in terms of quality and the things it could do. It didn't really come of age in terms of simplicity. Um, the Dolly 2 model is pretty complex compared to today's models, um, but it was the first one to have that really exceptional ability to create high quality images from text, very high quality images. What did they do? They said, okay, Effectively, I'm having a glide model here, so a text-conditioned diffusion model decoder. But I'm not going to just text condition. The text, yes, comes in from here. It does make it in. But I'm also going to actually turn my text into an embedding, and I'm going to translate that embedding into an image embedding, and I'm also going to condition on this image embedding. And this text embedding came from CLIP, which is an unsupervised image text alignment training method that generates both text and image embeddings. And so they would train something that learns to translate between the text embedding and the image embedding. You might say, why they're not the same if they're supposed to be aligned? It turns out images are much richer than text in detail. So the image embedding tends to have more information than the text embedding. And this translation here that's learned is another diffusion model, the one that worked best. is another diffusion model because they're really good at modeling multimodal distributions. So you go from this text embedding to a good, one of the many possible good matching image embeddings, and then from there, do another diffusion run to get your image out, and then you might do another run to upsample, another one to upsample again. In this case, no conditioning in the upsamplers. Why? Well, you can maybe use more training data if you don't need captions to train your upsamplers. You can use any image anywhere to train your upsampler. Let's see. Wilson, I need to hand it over to you soon. I see you have a lot to cover. Let's see. Um, here are some of the examples from um, from Dolly 2. Um, they also they actually called it unclip also themselves because it's really you know taking a clip embedding and turning it back into an image. Um, you can encode with clip, then decode and sample. And what you see here is that indeed uh, once you encode it with clip, um, the clip encoding is something higher level semantic because once you decode, you get semantically related concepts back, but not the same thing back. So there's some kind of evidence for the semantic level understanding of CLIP and also the ability to deal with that multimodal generation you need to solve uh, given uh, it's a semantic understanding, not a pixel level understanding you get in your embeddings. Interpolations in CLIP embedding space allows you to interpolate uh, things that are wildly different yet uh, make good interpolations. Um, and then Dolly 3 came out just recently, um, which was essentially um, saying maybe we just needed more detailed captions for our images. We need a larger data set with more detailed captions. Our captioning AI systems are maybe good enough to generate detailed captions. So let's first set up a real good captioning system, run that on a lot of images, use the detailed captions to train our system to do generation, and that's, um, they don't give a whole lot of detail in the paper as part of it. Um, it sounds like they're running some kind of stable diffusion model, which uh, Wilson will cover, um, but they didn't really share um, a lot of detail. They did seem to indicate that with their stable diffusion, um, the decoder is still a diffusion, not a VAE decoder, um, but again, um, not a lot of detail being shared. Um, and this is what you can get now. I mean, the realism is becoming quite extreme, at least, I mean, in terms of what you would want in these situations. So you can provide very detailed captions, pays attention to all the details in the captions. In parallel to the DALI line of work, there was a simpler line of work at Google. Um, Jonathan Ho was one of the main contributors there again. And essentially, 
they said, um, we just need to scale up these text to image um, models the right way. Um, so they just take a text encoder, generate a text embedding from using a language model rather than clip or anything like that, just use a language model, turn text into a text embedding, text conditional, diffusion model, super resolution, super resolution, and call it done. And the results are extremely similar in quality and abilities as the OpenAI DALI 2 model. So um, in some sense, this is the, the easier, um, well, the simpler architecture uh, compared to DALI 2, but um, uh, yeah, these things were just developed in, in parallel. One of their key observations was that as they decided to use bigger models, that they realized that the main, main benefit from scaling up was in the better text embeddings at the time, rather than better or larger diffusion models. So people had not been using good enough text embedders uh, to get the best quality results. Um, and they introduced an efficient unit, uh, which means you put more model parameters at the low resolution where things are more semantically processed uh, compared to previous models. And here are the imagined results, again, very similar to DALI 2 uh, type results. Also works with text pretty well. Um, DALI 2 didn't work as well with text, but DALI 3 uh, works better with text also. Wilson, I'm going to give it to you here. So use, your, use your finger to swipe and then you can just write. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's better than last time. Uh, okay, yeah, so as Peter mentioned, I'll mainly be going into some of the deep deeper stuff for like some portion of it, and then Kevin will be uh, talking about the rest of it. Um, so I'll start off with like some of the more fundamental stuff for diffusion models about like sampling noise schedules and um, how things are parameterized, and then I'll talk about specific like neural net architectures that people use before and like now. Okay, okay so there's, so I guess one unique thing about diffusion models is that um, during training, almost everyone, most people train the same way, using the same objective that, that Peter talked about. Um, but then the main difference is during inference, when you actually want to sample an image or a video or, or whatever data you're actually modeling, uh, there's like a lot of choices. There's been like so many papers on, on different kinds of samplers. Um, but for now, I'll probably just, we'll just cover the single one called DDIM or DDIM, uh, mainly since it's probably one of the simplest to implement and also easiest to understand um, in terms of the, the sampling algorithms. Um, so just to start off, I'll probably do some slight notation changing uh, just to make things a little bit simpler. Um, so on the top right here, so here, this is just the standard denoising that we had in DDPM. Um, and then we'll just replace some variables. So uh, alpha t and sigma t are like this. And then the denoising step is, is just x t is equal to alpha t, x naught plus sigma t epsilon. And then for the DDM sampler, so the, the way the, the reverse process works is that it's like essentially like xt minus 1. Oops. You get like some function of like, uh, let's say xt. And then you, you apply that like t times until you get to t is equal to 0. Uh, and then you have your image or video or whatever. Um, and the way this update here works is actually decently intuitive. Uh, so here is this up here on the top right. It's just a reordering of the original equation that I have. Because originally it was like xt is equal to alpha t plus sigma t epsilon. Just shuffling some terms around to isolate at x naught. Um, and that's exactly what this is here. So this is your, your, your diffusion model outputs the epsilon here. And then, um, you can apply this equation up here to estimate. So this is basically x hat. So this is saying I'm given uh, my noisy image at diffusion time step t. I compute epsilon, and then I can kind of run it through like the reverse formula for the for the denoising to estimate what the original x hat naught is. Um, and the way update is formulated is basically some weighting of this x hat naught, so alpha t minus one, and then this is like kind of like the direction that your model predicts to update. 
So plus sigma t minus 1. And then th this will just be equal to x t minus 1. And then you kind of apply this update multiple times until you get to t is equal to 0. Uh, one other way to think about dim is you can kind of think about uh, think about this as kind of like a like differential equation. And then dim is using like the most simple like like Euler-based solver uh, to, to do the reverse process. And then the one nice thing about DDIM is that you can then choose different sampling steps. So for example, most diffusion models, you train for like 1,000 denoising time steps or 4,000 even, I've seen 8,000. Um, so if you want to like, the standard way to sample would be you do like 8,000 like reverse steps for the diffusion. Um, but for most other samplers, you can just flexibly choose. You can kind of like, um, like skip steps. So you, you, you can do like, fit like, 20 or 30 steps at a time. So in total, if like your diffusion was a thousand steps and you do like every 20 steps, then you'd have only like uh, like 50 actual sampling steps. Uh, the only so the trade-off is that the fewer the number of steps, the faster it is because the less forward passes you have to make to your model. Um, but the, the like the the consequence is that your sampler your your samples might be worse uh, if you have fewer samples or if you have fewer steps. Um, so this is just like a, there's not really an intuitive understanding of like how many sampling steps you want to do in the sense that you probably just want to try everything initially from like 10 to however the max number of steps and then see uh, what the quality is like. <laughs> uh, almost always something like like 50 would probably work. So th this is like different, essentially the sample quality of the different number of time steps. So you can see at time step T or, or at 10 sampling steps, the car is a little bit blurry here, but then it gets like clearer and clearer as you have more sampling steps. But after enough steps, it's like, it's usually like good enough, essentially. Um, and in this case, usually 50 is a pretty good number to just start with if you just want to play around with the model or something. Okay. Um, so that's a sampling algorithm. That one I also I wanted to mainly touch on because DDIM is also very important for other stuff that I'll be covering, uh, which is used for to, to edit images and videos and stuff like that. Um, but the next part is Something slightly different. It's kind of touching on the actual objective for for the diffusion model. So the standard DDPM is basically like the L simple loss is a loss on epsilon. Um, so this is exactly just the the loss that Peter showed. Epsilon minus epsilon hat of that's xt. And there's a different, and alternative way you can do is that instead of an L2 loss on epsilon, what some people have also tried is you can just do an L2, L2 loss on uh, the original image itself. So instead of so instead of the unit predicting the epsilon that was used to noise the image, it's now predicting the original image from the, the noise image. So this is still xt. And there is a, like a relationship between these two, between epsilon and x. So if this is your original denoising equation, you can do another thing to isolate x naught, very similar to what was done for DDIM. Um, and then you can take this, and then you can just essentially plug it into there. So here, for these ones, it's epsilon here, and this is epsilon hat. That's the only really, really the only difference. Everything else is the same. Uh, and then if you kind of shuffle some terms around, things cancel like like this. This cancels. And then you can factor out the, the sigma t and alpha t. Um, you get this here. Which, and then if you want to move it to the other side, the bottom is, is just doing the, the reciprocal. Um, so if you do want to train with losses on x space, that's essentially equivalent to training with losses on epsilon space, uh, just with a slight reweighting based on the time step t. Alpha t over sigma t squared. Another term for this here is is kind of like the signal to noise ratio, because here alpha is you're waiting on x naught and sigma is on epsilon, so um, so at like t is equal to zero you have like alpha t is equal to one and sigma t is equal to zero, so your your, your SNR is is infinity because there's no noise, and then at t is equal to like the max t. It's the other way around. So your, your SNR would be zero in that case. Um, so that's like another 
like if you read the diffusion literature, it'll be very common where they they refer to this weighting as like the SNR, or if they take the log of it, it'll be the log SNR, um, stuff like that. Okay, and so there, yeah, there's epsilon space and x space, and there's one other one that is is kind of weird. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, that, but I do, it would be good to cover because it's probably one of the most popular reparameterizations that are used in like almost every model right now. Um, so the way this new reparameterization works is that here we have our original weights before we replace things. So we have root alpha bar t and root one minus alpha bar t. And then, so this is constrained to be like, this follows the property that like sigma, oops, alpha t is sigma t squared is equal to one. Or you can also just view these as 2D coordinates that, apply, that are just lie on the unit circle or part of the unit circle, I guess. Um, and, um, and yeah, so instead of basically doing it in terms of time step t, you can kind of do this in like almost like polar coordinates where you, you reparameterize everything in terms of phi instead of t. So this will just be the angle of, of, of this vector here, essentially. And, uh, and yeah, so now the forward process is just, is just this cosine. This just used to be xt is equal to, uh, alpha t and, and this is just cosine of phi and this is just sine of phi. Um, and then after that, what they did was they just took the derivative to define a velocity as just this term. This is just like a standard derivative of, of, of the, the equation above uh, with, with trig functions. Um, and then if you do some math, essentially, the, the DDIM update rule can actually be, the, I think the main goal they did this, this is a really kind of weird thing to do. It's not super intuitive at first. Uh, but the, the end consequence is that uh, it really does simplify the update rule quite a bit. So this is the DDIM update rule versus before it was like, uh, something a lot more complicated, like xt minus 1 is equal to, like, alpha t minus 1, xt minus. Alpha t. Something like that. Uh, a little bit messy, but yeah. Um, so now it's just a function of basically the, the delta here. So cosine of delta, uh, z phi t here is just x phi t, and then um, plus the the v that you predict. So so in this case, your model is parameterized to not predict epsilon. It's not it's not it's designed to predict this this v like velocity term that it outputs. Yeah. Phi t minus. Or instead of like minus one, it, it just like delta is the difference. Instead of like a difference of one, I guess. That's how I describe it. Yeah. So the, I mean, in terms of training, in terms of implementation, it's, it's quite, like the math behind it is quite complicated, but in terms of implementation, it's like pretty easy. It's like almost no different than your other, uh, the, the code for the other objectives. This is still xt. Um, this neural net, it doesn't change. The only difference is that the target that you compute is different, which is just follows this formula. Uh, so you, you still take your out, you still compute alpha t, sigma t, um, and you still sample noise, uh, but instead of having the target be epsilon or x naught, you just have uh, v, which is this is this this function of, of both of those. And yeah, so similar to how epsilon is related to uh, or epsilon space is related to x space. Um, loss in this v space is also related to um, x space as well. You can follow a very similar pattern uh, of doing the x naught. Um, or sorry. Yeah. Uh, of where you write things in terms of x naught, and then you can replace things. Uh, terms cancel again, like this and this term. And then you basically get this. And then if you take the reciprocal here, you can also get this, which is basically just like 
1 over sigma t squared, and then using the fact that they sum up to 1 if they're squared. Uh, do sigma t squared. So that's just equal to 1 plus. Which is just this, this coefficient here. Which is essentially a different weighting of, of the original loss. I guess in this one, it makes sure that uh, the loss is always at least like a weighting of 1, regardless of what like the sigma to Reynolds ratio is. Versus for epsilon space, it would be kind of like a weighting of the SNR exactly, which would range from like 0 to infinity, pretty much. Uh, and yeah, so in practice, B space is probably the one that works best out of all the ones I've seen. It's it's kind of subtle. It's not like a substantial, substantial difference. But this was from, uh, I think, video diffusion models paper, uh, where, so this is the, the, the top row is the input frames, and then the middle is with epsilon prediction, samples mm -hmm. of that, and then the bottom row is with V prediction. It's like, you have to kind of really look at it, but there's like fewer artifacts. I think, like, maybe between these two images is probably most apparent. I don't know if you know if you can see on the slides. Are you guys able to see a difference? <laughs> it's, it's pretty subtle. It, it, it's like a slightly grainier, like, for epsilon. Um, but I think since, like, for everyone, it's just like a, a why not, I guess. So almost all papers, almost all papers I'll be talking about, like 90% of them will end up just doing prediction in this space. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, and the last part, okay, so this part that I'll move on to is, is kind of a subtle one, but this actually surprisingly makes a really big difference, and it's something that most people would want to use or implement um, if they're training a diffusion model. Um, so one of the main issues in these common noise schedules for diffusion models is that the relevant one is original here. So original is the general like noise schedules that people use. So the x-axis here is alpha bar or, or the alpha t has I was describing. So this ranges from it should be from range go from go like go like monotonically from one to zero, and then you'll notice something weird because it should kind of end at zero on the last time step. Is that the last time step of the diffusion process, your signal should be completely noise. Like there should be nothing left in the original signal. But in this case, these noise schedules, this blue curve, it ends something like kind of above zero. In practice, it's something pretty small. So it could be something like a, like 0 0.06. Or for a different schedule, it could be like, like 1e e minus 5 or something. Something pretty close to zero. Um, but this is actually like a pretty big problem that people kind of found. Like, it, it, like, like if, if you train it with the schedules as, as people have did for a while, you, you'll still get good samples. You'll still get samples, um, but there's still like a decent amount of improvement you can get by fixing this weird issue. And the reason it's an issue, uh, is there a slide that was? Oh, okay, never mind. Okay. I'll, I'll talk about the next slide. Um, so I guess one, one of the reasons why it doesn't actually end in zero with the noise schedule is partially because at the maximum time step of the diffusion, the with, at least with epsilon base loss, you have this. Technically, it should be alpha t is equal to zero and sigma t is equal to one. So your your data should be completely noised out and and filled with and replaced with Gaussian noise. That's random. Um, but your objective your objective becomes something not very meaningful, because here you just have this is just epsilon. So then your your network is saying, I want to predict epsilon given epsilon, which is a very easy task to learn. I mean, as long as your model learns to be at any function, it will essentially always get it right. And it, it probably will if you, if you train on it. Um, so it's, it's not a very meaningful task here. And But the reason why we kind of want to fix this, so that's kind of why they needed like like this to not be zero, this to be something like like one e minus five, and this to be like one minus one e minus or, or or something very close to to one, just so there's a little bit of signal there to still denoise. But the main issue is that this is fine during training, 
But during inference, we're actually always starting from Gaussian noise. We're sampling from, from a, a random normal distribution, and then we want to denoise back. Um, but this is kind of out of distribution from training. So what, what it essentially ends up doing is the network tries to kind of infer, like, like you're sampling random Gaussian noise, but then during inference, it, it always thinks that there is still a little bit of signal in here. Um, even though it might be like a very low weighting, it, it still tries to interpret some sort of like global signal where there is none, and then which kind of messes up the like the sampling process to an extent. And so basically, what this paper did was um, they just enforced it. So so orange is is their model. So they just kind of shifted the schedule to actually be zero here. So that's actually zero. And then the other issue, as I kind of mentioned, is that you can't release epsilon loss at this point just because the objective is kind of meaningless. So what they did here uh, was they just used vspace loss. So for vspace, uh, if you plug everything in at t is equal to the maximum t, uh, you'll just get this objective, which is meaningful. So it's basically saying, given random noise, just predict uh, the original image. Here? You mean that? Yeah. Oh, wait, uh, wait, actually, sorry. Let me. Oh, no, no, sorry. This should. Minus epsilon, minus beta epsilon, then you can just take out the negative, take out the negative, take out the negative, take out the negative, take out the Okay, there's like epsilon minus signatures. I will have to double check that. Uh, I guess the objective should be to predict x naught, but yeah, I'll. So this is minus x naught. Which is kind of weird. I will double check that later. But yeah. Um, yeah. So the the general process for for this paper is uh, it's pretty simple. So you just do the rescaling thing. So like the the orange curve that I showed before of the noise schedule to actually end at zero S and R, and then you can just take your diffusion model if you trained it. With epsilon, you, you could just fine tune it for, for like v space prediction. It's not that big of a deal to change the parameterization, um, and then you can just fine tune it on v space and also the, the the noise schedule. And they did this for some models. So for stable stable diffusion, it was trained in epsilon space, so they had to fine tune both for zero SMR and for v space. Or, well, I, I'm actually not sure what iteration of stable diffusion they used because one of the versions was epsilon space, and then they fine tuned the v space one. So it's not sure. Um, but this is basically the, the result, is that, um, and sometimes it almost looks like the, the, the variant, like the diversity has reduced a little bit, or maybe it's also more faithful to the, the prompt now. Um, but in general, the, the structure and coherence, like the global coherence of the images are, are definitely sharper uh, compared to a stable diffusion by itself. Or you have like two beaks here, it's unclear what the thing behind that is, stuff like that. And I think, more importantly, it's even more important a video where I've seen, you can see a lot larger differences. So this was from uh, Emu Video from Meta. Uh, so the, the top one here is using zero SNR, and the bottom is without. So there are like differences in the frames. Like for, for these dolphins here, it's a little bit less coherent where they start kind of shifting. Uh, it's even more obvious here where it's unclear what, what exactly is happening, uh, where, where the video kind of goes crazy. Yeah. Versus the top row here, it's pretty smooth, pretty coherent, stuff like that. Take my time. OK. Uh, so that was some basics with some of the diffusion uh, details. Now I'll start talking about the different architectures and kind of, I guess not even just architectures, but just like uh, 
philosophies of designing these uh, these Im image or video generation models. So Peter, I think, briefly talked about this with the UNet. So most most diffusion models for for image or video right now use UNet based architectures, um, with some small like modifications of like uh, like maybe in these lower layers you have some self retention, um, and then you also include like conditioning of like the diffusion time step embedding. But aside from that, it's all pretty similar. And then there's a lot to play with in terms of like uh, how many filters you want per layer, how much you downsample, how fast, how, how aggressively you downsample different resolutions, uh, stuff like that. And the exact way conditioning works here is that you just have your time step T. So this could just be like uh, an integer, basically. And then uh, you feed it through a sinusoidal embedding, very similar to the positional embeddings, or almost exactly the same as the ones in like transformer, sinusoidal positional embeddings, to get a, a vector. And then you just feed it through a small MLP to, to get a conditioning vector here. And then you feed it into the unit. And once you get into the unit, I've seen two, generally two different ways to do it. The simplest way is that, uh, so H here is like your convolutional feature network or, fe or features. So it's like height by width by dimension. And then your embedding is just a single vector. You can um, basically single vector. And then the easiest way to do it is you just add it. So th th this will happen at every single like res block in the network. So if, if your network has 20 res blocks, you'll, you'll, you'll see this operation 20 times. Um, something that is also used, I think more frequently, is that you you use the conditioning as like parameters to modulate your features. So you have a group form on your H, and then you do a scale and a shift by a function of of the of the time step embedding here. So this this would be like a this would be like a single linear layer. So this is like a linear projection. And then this is also a linear projection. And then you have new parameters at every layer. OK. So and kind of like some, some work after this, the, the question arises, because the, the past models, like for DDPM, was originally on, on pixels. Uh, then the natural question, you know, with all the work we've seen with VQGAN, stuff like that, is like, can we make this more efficient? I mean, pixels, doing stuff directly on pixels is usually kind of expensive. And what we can do here instead of learning a VQGAN is we can learn a VAE, exactly the same as like what we covered two weeks ago. And the only caveat is the, the loss is all the same, but it's, I guess in some sense it's like a beta VAE where the KL loss is just extremely low. It's like 1e e minus 6, where it's basically almost like in consequence, like, it matters a tiny, tiny bit where it says, basically it's saying just like, you can you can have Z structured however you want, but just don't make it too crazy, essentially. Like, um, just make it roughly, maybe, like, it roughly keeps things possibly bounded, May, maybe not have like super weird, like sharp discontinuities or, or behaviors. Um, that's the idea. And, but otherwise it's like very similar to like, architecture wise, it'd be very similar to like a VQ GAN. Um, where you have your encoder and then Z and then your decoder. Uh, but the only difference is that Z in this case is, is continuous. And that's also kind of important. And it's also one, I guess, one of the more useful aspects of diffusion models compared to like an autoaggressive model. These models can both like learn very complex distributions. Um, but the main benefit of a diffusion model is that you, you don't need the data to be discrete. So like if I wanted to like uh, model like like the, the robot the movement of a robot arm that's parameterized by some sort of like like continuous like joint joint forces or velocity or something like that that's all kind of like continuous data. Um, if I wanted to model with an autoaggressive model, I would have to figure out how to like make it discrete somehow, uh, which depending on your modality can be kind of hard uh, or like non obvious how exactly to do it. Um, so the nice thing about diffusion is that it doesn't really matter in that case, where you, you can actually just directly model that data. Um, which I think why 
it could be more used, or it has seen more adoption in, in, in other domains where it's not as obvious of how to actually make something discrete. And this, so this is the land diffusion model architecture. It is, so th th this here is your VAE. And then this is essentially just DDPM, I guess. Or like maybe uh, the one from OpenAI, like the, the ADM model, if I remember that's what it's called. <laughs> Uh, but just some sort of any generic diffusion model. It, it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, the, the, these two models are like pretty are pretty distinct, so one doesn't depend on the other. Uh, just the fact that now a after you learn your VAE, you have a much a much lower dimensional latent space, and then you can model things a lot more uh, like a lot more cheaply. Where before it was maybe a 256 by 256, now it's 32 by 32, uh, and it's a lot more flops efficient. So same thing with the VQGAN. There is still kind of like the speed quality trade-off, where my VAE can like I can super aggressively downsample things. I can downsample it to a single vector. Uh, just in that case, your your reconstruction starts, your reconstruction at, like your reconstruction fidelity starts going down. Um, but if your thing is super compressed, then you can also have a really like it's really cheap for the diffusion model to model it. On the other hand, if your VAE doesn't really compress that much, maybe only downsamples to a factor of two, or, or maybe it doesn't even downsample, um, then the consequence to your diffusion model would have a harder, it would be a more complex distribution of model, it would also be more flops intensive, uh, stuff like that. So that's kind of like a sweet spot, essentially. I think in LDM, it was something like LDM 4 to 8. So what this training curve is, is essentially, uh, over the course of training for each model, they just uh, took samples at every every so often to measure the FID. In this case, the, the lower the FID, the better. Um, so the so you want the curves to basically be as low as possible. So like, so these these curves here, which generally corresponds to like the I guess the the middle three here. Where for LDM one and two, because I, I think these experiments were also flops constrained, so all the models had the same number of like total training flops. Uh, so I, so I, I would assume they made the models for LD1 and 2 smaller, just, just because they're, they're operating on like more pixels, so they're more computationally expensive, so they couldn't scale as, as big. Uh, versus the more compressed ones, you can then model, um, you can have a larger model, because it, it's cheaper, it's like, it's like a few number of flops per parameter that you add. Um, and then you can make an even bigger model for like LDM32, where they downsample, I guess, by a factor of 32. So that's probably down to like an 8 by 8 uh, latent size. Um, but your, your, your generation quality here, you can see kind of plateaus here. Um, probably because it could be bounded by like just the, like the reconstruction quality of the, of the original image itself. And then on the right here, we have sampling throughput. Um, I think, yeah, basically where each point for each color is like the model at different number of sampling steps. So on, on the very right here, it'd be like very few sampling steps because you have higher throughput. And on the very left, you would have uh, much more sampling steps because, because then, then it takes longer to generate each image. Um, but these are some more results for, for, for here where like red and purple generally did, did pretty well, or green, red, and purple. So around a downside factor of like four to 16. But this is something you generally just like play around with. Um, it's a trade off of like how much compute do I have and how good of results do I want to get, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, and okay, stable diffusion. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard it or even tried to use this model. Uh, it's essentially LDM. Um, pretty much exactly the LDM paper I just talked about, but uh, scaled up on more images doing text image generation. Uh, you have a VAE that downsamples by factor of eight. Um, it can support, you can downsample to 56 down to 32 by 32, or even, or more generally, uh, I think natively it supports 512 downsamples to 64 by 64. Uh, still the unit architecture with self-attention layers, and then they implement, uh, text conditioning by just adding extra cross-attention layers after each self-attention layer. And those cross-attention layers just, uh, attend from the, the image features to the, the text features. 
And for this model, the text features were just using a clip text encoder. Right. And yeah, you can get some pretty nice images. This was two, two years ago. Is that when it came out? Not, not too long ago. But yeah, it's only, it's only gotten better ever since. And this one was more recent. This was, I guess, for the, from the same, the same company. They released stable video diffusion, or uh, yeah, stable video diffusion. And uh, the way this one was trained was fairly simple. At, at its core, it's almost the same model as just stable diffusion. They just initialize it from it. The main issue is stable diffusion operates on images. So it's like 2D convolutions, uh, spatial attention, stuff like that. So then the question is, how do you extend this to, a, to, to video? Um, and the video itself is just, a stack, it's just the stacking of frames over time. Um, so what most papers did, like SV did here did, and like a few other papers, um, essentially, what we can do is you can just insert temporal layers in in, in, in between. So after after every two uh, D comp, you have like a one D comp over time. After every spatial attention, you have another maybe attention over over time, or maybe even just like a full attention over the entire video. Um, and then and then yeah, you just, you just do that. So the temporal layers are initialized from scratch, and the spatial layers. Like the 2D comms are all initialized from like the original text to image model. And you just take this model and you just fine tune it on your video data, which is probably one of the core things that SVD looked at, which is kind of unique because their entire text to video data set was basically completely synthetically generated, at least the text part. They just scraped a bunch of uh, videos online uh, without text labels, and then they just used different captioners uh, to, to label each video and then use that as data after like a lot of a lot of data filtering. Like clip score, basically how how accurately does this text, this generated text correspond to the video? Um, so you want to keep ones that are higher. Optical floor, flow score usually helps to filter out all of the videos that don't have motion. You know, may, may, maybe there's a video, there's a lot of videos of people doing PowerPoint presentations online. You know, it's just like an image or, or even videos of like people just doing like, uh, yeah, like doing slides between like still images. You want to exclude all those because you, you want to generate an interesting video. So you want video that has actual motion. Um, aesthetic scores, I guess if it, if it looks nice, it's kind of subjective and hard to measure, but people, I guess, have collected data sets to try to measure or to try to collect data sets with images with like high, that, that basically look good. Um, and OCR might be if they may or may not want to include text um, in, in their pipe or like text generation. Of like, or like, Im like image generation with text in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, I guess one, one other point that would be useful to mention is that uh, like this general tra training paradigm is not new, as I mentioned, to SVD. Um, the only difference with some prior works, um, like e Emu Video from uh, Facebook or Lumiere from Google, they all also initialize from a text to image model. Um, but in those cases, they actually trained it a little bit differently, where they added the temporal layers, um, but they trained the whole model with the spatial parameters frozen. So they only trained the temporal layers for those. Um, yes? Are the distortions in the same as they just retrain the spatial stuff by itself, so basically each individual frame as if it's like an image model, and then after they pre-trained that, they froze it, and then they trained the temporal aspect, so they don't jointly... That's for those other papers, yeah, they, they don't. Or they, they, they don't, they, they just take like, because it's probably, let's say at, at Meta, there's a whole team that's working on real, uh, designing a really good text to image model uh, that they've collected a lot of good data and they've made this really good model, so now the video team, they're just gonna take that and then they're just gonna add some layers, freeze everything except the new layers and, and then train on video. And then my second question is, do you know how the 1D cons and temporal retention compare? Just because like 1D cons, like, is this like really old way of doing like temporal data that nobody really uh, 1D comp is use. I guess it's useful for local temporal dependencies. That usually it's just both. It's just both of them. They have both convolutions and attention. Yeah. Um, these are videos. I guess. Oh, I guess videos won't <laughs> won't play. Will they? Okay. I guess you can imagine it moving. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Um. Okay. 
Uh, okay, yeah. So, so that was the general paradigm of where people have trained these models of, oh, uh, here is, let, let's learn a VAE with a latent space, and then let's just train a, a single model over, over this distribution. So it's kind of like a, it's like a one step generation kind of thing. Um, the other area that people have explored is just using cascaded models. Um, so basically where you progressively generate. So this is where Peter was mentioning for Imagine. They have like a base model and then different super resolution models that generate larger and larger resolution. You can kind of interpret it as a latent variable model where the, the lower resolution images are different latent variables. Um, so yeah, I mean, the architecture for these, these are pretty simple. You just train one unconditional model. This is just like a standard diffusion model, like a unit that's unconditional or just conditional on class or on text only. And then the rest are just super, super resolution models. And then for this, uh, architecturally is very simple. You can just, uh, for, for an unconditional model, you just feed an epsilon, uh, for, for or sorry, feed in the noise, the noise video or noise image. Uh, and then, if you want to condition on a low resolution thing, all you have to do is just you just uh, you, you upsample it using some sort of upsampling method to, to be the same size as your input, concatenate it over like channel dimension, and then you can just feed it through the, the model, and it'll just everything else is identical. Um, the one really nice thing about these cascaded models is that especially if you're on like a compute budget where I only have oh, x amount of GPUs available. Um, you can then, what you're doing is you're just breaking up this problem into a lot of independent smaller pieces. Um, so each of these models, uh, so if maybe if you want to train the whole thing to generate 256 all at once, maybe the whole model will have to be like 3 billion parameters. But maybe for, uh, for this, you can distribute it to be like 1 billion model for each, uh, for each resolution. Or maybe 2, 2 billion models here, or 2 billion parameters here, and like, like 0.5b, like 0.5b or something. Um, and then each of these models by itself is more manageable to train. And you can also do more specific hyperparameter tuning. Because especially for diffusion models in literature, it's been, it's been shown that like high resolution and lower resolution need very different hyperparameters. Um, like so stuff like that. Like for the noise schedules, how much noise you want to add are usually pretty different for, for each resolution. Um, so if you split up the problem like this, it makes it easier to manage. It, but it's a little bit more annoying because you have to then train all these different models. And your pipeline's a little bit more complicated. Okay, I'll try to speed up a little bit. Um, let's let's skip this. Um, so here is so this is some examples from their initial results. Uh, very, I guess this is still low, like everything is still kind of low resolution here. The base was sixteen by sixteen, which is pretty blurry, and then they had an upsample, a super resolution model of sixteen to sixty four by sixty four. Nothing, not, nothing too surprising. Uh, we can, we can skip this too. Um, so the, okay, so I guess, so then the scaled up version of this on video. So Peter talked about Imagine, which was a, a pretty scaled up version of cascaded diffusion models I talked about. And Imagine video is just a lot of cascades. You, you, you can see, so this is the, the, the text portion here. Everything to the left, uh, and then everything after that is slowly generating the video to result in basically 1280 by 768, 24 FPS over I guess like five seconds. Um, where they have the base model, which is unconditional. Then they they do super resolution over time, then over over space, and then over space, then time, then time, then space. I don't know how they chose when to do what. Um, so I guess it seems reasonable. It's like somehow interleaved. And then one interesting thing is you, you can see the model sizes start decreasing as you go to higher and higher resolution just because uh, super high resolution is just like a lot of flops. It's like a lot of com com computation power you need. So it becomes more expensive. And intuitively, you also probably don't need that much compute to model the super resolution just because like there's already so much information from like 320 by 192 to 12, 12, 1280 by 768, um, there's only like a little bit of extra information that you, you might need to introduce. And the way their, their, their model worked is, it's kind of similar to like stable video diffusion where you have like, but, but this is all trained from scratch. So there's no initialization from like a text to image. This is, everything is trained from scratch. 
uh, where you have uh, things per frame. So you have like spatial operations per frame, and then you have like temporal operations here. And then it's like spatial, then temporal, then spatial, then temporal. Yeah. So some key aspects here is kind of as I mentioned, the cascaded structure allows better scalability potentially, or if you're on like a more limited compute budget. There was some augmentation they added for super resolution models. That, that was the aspect that kind of skipped for the uh, the cascaded models, where you can add some noise as you train the super resolution models. Um, very important here, this is probably one of the more important things, is video image joint training. Um, usually because image text to image data is significantly more diverse than text to video data, and, and there's a lot more of it too. Um, so then if you want to capture certain things that like different styles, like 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 generating a video of, of X in, in like a painting style or like make it a sketch or, or something, there might not be actual text video uh, data for that, but if you jointly train on both video and images, it, it will generally transfer some of that capabilities between the two, the, the two like modalities because they're very close. And also like a, a decent high quality data set you can train on, which is pretty important. Roughly 40 million text video images and then 500 million text image. Okay, you can also imagine it running. I, I guess it'll be like this for most of the videos. Uh, and and it's, it should be filling up. Okay, I guess we'll figure out what to do for the, the video generation lecture. <laughs> Is that would be... Yeah. Um, and then this is, so I guess the, so those were all UDETs still that I talked about, convolutional based models. Uh, I guess the, the, the latest thing is more transformers with all the latest papers. Basically, I mean, architecturally it's fairly simple. So it's still the same input and output as like a unit. Uh, but in this case, it's just like a vision transformer where you take an input and you, you patchify it uh, into tokens. So it's like a strided like two by two convolution or four by four convolution. And then uh, you flatten everything, you feed it through a transformer, and then it, it outputs um, it, it, it outputs like the it predicts the noise. And in this case, it was based on like the, the paper from OpenAI, so they also predict the the, the variance as well. And the, the main thing here is how they introduce how you do the conditioning of the time step embedding. Um, this is it's very similar to how you they, I described the like the modulated um, aspect in the units for time steps, where your um, so this is T embedding. It outputs the scale and bias, and also kind of like a gating here but, but between each layer that you can apply. And, and that's like pretty much the core architecture. This aspect is important. I think they ablated it. But I think the core thing here is just the transform architecture. And in general, it's more scalable, as, as we'll see. So this was one paper that came out, I think December, um, called Walt. Google that use transformers. Um, this first part is just a 3D CNN VAE. So very similar to let's say the VAEs for stable diffusion, but just for videos. You just make it instead of a instead of 2D cons, you make the cons 3D, you make a down sample over space and time uh, to get something like like uh, like 32 by 32 by like four by four. So like H by W I see or something. Um, with the exception that the first frame is encoded separately. So it's like first frame is an image, and then you have the rest of like your, your video encoding. So the, this is the only because they can jointly train image videos still, which is still important. And then after that, it's basically just like a transformer with slight, with like maybe a slightly fancier architecture of like factorized attention. Um, they have zero SNR which I talked about earlier. Um, instead of the added LN block that I mentioned before, it's like something slightly different. And they had something called latent self-conditioning, which I won't really go into. But if you're interested in, there's the link to the paper, uh, which you can look at later. Um, and then their model was 3 billion parameters. So this is also much smaller than Imagine Video. Imagine Video in total was maybe like 12 billion or 10 billion. Um, but this, was also a, this is also a single model, a single transformer model. And this is uh, things that have the potential to move. But yeah. 
but in general, I think overall, like better motion than some of the other in Imagine Video, for example. Not 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 as much uh, weird things. Yes. You can. Uh, I think you can. Like for uh, for this one, I think it's just for efficiency. You can do like a factorized attention. It's just like for computational like benefits. But you you can just attend over everything. I would probably bet. I mean, in the limit, I would bet on just full attention, probably. For but if you if you're yeah yeah. Uh, and Asora, which. Peter talked about, there's not really any details, so there's not that much to mention, but it, it's also a diffusion transformer, supposedly. Um, one interesting was they, I guess one of the other benefits of using a transformer and how you can tokenize things is that it's very, and then the consequence is that after you tokenize everything, you flatten into one long sequence. So when you flatten everything, it, it becomes kind of agnostic to what the original shape of, what the shape of the original input is. You can always feed in some information on the original shape. But then you can then flexibly do things on different like different resolutions. Because I, I think they probably train things at different resolutions, maybe at different time scales, maybe like higher resolution images with lower resolution images. And it's like so much easier if everything's just like flattened out into a single like one D sequence versus trying to manage to do this with like a unit and how to make it support different resolutions all at the same time. And and I imagine the training pipeline for that would be horrendous. Yeah. And it could also have been trained with some sort of random masking because they do have different capabilities like video prediction, infilling, uh, like extrapolation of some sort, but who knows. And today they had Stable Diffusion 3 came out. It's probably one of the largest uh, open source text or even just text image models I know of, of 8 billion parameters. Um, this one was also a diffusion transformer. So I don't know why the last like two weeks have just been transformers for diffusion. Um, they mentioned using flow matching, which we don't cover in this class, but I think has been like a, gen a like a general paradigm that's been gaining more traction lately. So it, it could be interesting to check the paper out. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, we'll we'll get started in a sec here. It's it's been a it's it's a very packed lecture because it's been a it's been a very fast moving field. So we're just gonna finish up with a few a few more topics relating to kind of diffusion models in practice. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to sample from diffusion models. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how diffusion models can be used as general representation learning um, and in fields other than images, which they also work on. Um, so progressive distillation, again, by, uh, by these two guys over here, is, is kind of tackling this issue where diffusion models are, are quite, they're, they're hard to sample from because they take a lot of steps. So even though diffusion models do pretty good on, on mode matching and on, um, on image quality, uh, because of this, this assumption that you have to progressively denoise the diffusion model, uh, they take a long time to sample for. So basically, the, the question uh, that they ask here in this paper is, um, how, can we, how can we solve that? So if, if we look at the original DDPM paper and, and even this um, follow up the diffusion model beat GANs paper, they use a thousand time steps of diffusion, which you, you can see takes a long time. Whereas if you're using something like a VAE or a GAN, you, you just have one step. So one thing we really want to do is figure out, well, how can we get this number down? Uh, and having this large N is pretty good for training. Uh, basically, and then we'll go over this in, in one of the, the slides in the future. Uh, but basically, as Peter said early on, uh, the, the reverse process of the, of the Gaussian noising process is only a Gaussian with a small enough step. So we really do need a small step to correctly train the backwards process. Um, but if we want to actually evaluate this, it might be nice if we can skip steps, if we, can, uh, if we can not take these infinitesimally small steps, but just take larger and larger ones. So the insight here with uh, progressive distillation is, well, let's take a pre-trained model that has n steps, and let's just try to cut, cut it down by two. So if we can get a good procedure that cuts down the number of steps by two, well, then we can actually repeat this as many times as we want uh, and then see how, how close we can get without losing the construction accuracy. So as a quick overview in the standard diffusion modeling process, we would sample an image, we would sample a time step and an epsilon and noise parameter. We would add epsilon to x, and then we would update the model to predict 
the original x, or in some cases you can predict epsilon or, or v, the combination of x, epsilon and x. Um, but, but kind of if you, if you think about predicting the original x, it's quite a tough distribution. And actually, if, you're, if your noise here is the fully noise diffusion model, uh, predicting the original x is actually this, this very hard problem. That, that's the, the full generation problem. And, and you can kind of think that this problem is not actually able to be modeled as a Gaussian. Like the probability distribution of the original data starting from nothing is definitely more than a Gaussian. It's a very complicated distribution. And so uh, it, it is a Gaussian if you only predict back one step, because that's easier. But the, the farther you go, the, the farther away your, your true distribution actually is uh, from a Gaussian. Uh, but the main idea in, in progressive distillation is if you have this teacher model, then what we can do is we can actually predict uh, what just exactly what the teacher is predicting. So here, let's say we started with this image x, um, and we, we noised it to get, let's call it x, x hat here. Uh, in a standard diffusion model, we would predict back to x. So let's call this x0. We would try to predict this. Uh, but this is a very hard problem. What we can do instead is we, we can kind of get this x here of um, t minus 2, something like this. So we can, we can get, we actually know what this kind of slightly unnoised version is from the teacher. Uh, and we just want to predict, we just want to train our, our student to, to match this. Uh, and here, we actually just run it twice. So, so the basic idea is take your teacher model and run the denoising process twice, and then train your student model to copy the, the twice diffusion process uh, in, in one step instead. So it actually turns out to be a very simple method. Uh, basically, train the teacher and then train the student to predict it uh, times two. Mm -hmm. This may be a bad question, but I'm wondering why, if like the original model is like a thousand, yeah. why not just train a new model using like 500 steps? Because when you train, you're just like sampling a T, and then you're immediately jumping to yeah. that deep, uh, like image at that particular step. Yeah. So, so the the answer is is basically has to do with this down here, where the more the more diffusion steps you try to to uh, learn the mapping from the reverse process from, the harder the problem is. Uh, and in the diffusion backwards process, we kind of assume that the, the true backwards process distribution is a Gaussian, uh, but it's not actually true. Um, whereas the, the prediction that's not all the way back to the, the unnoised image, uh, but only some steps, it is kind of closer to the Gaussian. So that's the reason why it's kind of better to run the teacher model first to actually learn all those marginal distributions. Uh, and then just copy those instead of trying to go all the way back. Uh, you could, in fact, it, you could try to, to train a diffusion model with just less steps. Um, it's not as good as, as training the full model first and then doing the distillation. Uh, so this is kind of a diagram of, of what they're doing here. Basically, we start from this, let's say this is the teacher model with the diffusion step of, of four time steps. What we would do is we would uh, basically distill it down into a second diffusion model that, that tries to model two steps in a single step, uh, and then all the way down to one over here. Uh, and here's some examples of, of how it works. So here we, we train first uh, the, the full teacher model here with 256 sampling steps. Uh, you can kind of see quality is quite good. And in fact, they can take it all the way down to, to four, so, so from 256 to four steps. Uh, and the quality is, is roughly the same. Uh, you can see that, I mean, there is some, some blurring, but um, like, I mean, this image is, is very close to the image over here. Uh, get, going from four to one is where it gets to be a problem. And, and you can see like the, the images over here, they're, they're much, although they kind of have the same semantic structure, uh, they're, they're missing a lot of details. Like this, this dog over here is, is missing the ear. And if you look too closely, you'll, you'll realize it's, it's kind of faking a lot of the details. So one kind of lesson to learn is you can actually get pretty far distilling down image-based diffusion models down to th around the realm of 16 or 18 steps without many tricks. You can just do this procedure here. Uh, but getting down from kind of 8 to, to 2 or 1 is where we'll really need some, some more insights. So that's what's coming up. Um, yeah, so he here's kind of one, one problem with, with the methodology we, we talked about before. So in the, in the progressive distillation paper, we try to, to distill many steps of diffusion process into one step. The problem is that this model of, of, that predicts all of these steps here uh, is still assumed to be a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian model. So 
So it's assumed that the true image is a discussion distribution centered around some mean. Uh, and we kind of know that in practice, that's, that's not the case. We, we need a, a more expressive distribution. Uh, it's a Gaussian again, yeah, here, only, only for small step sizes. Uh, and the true distribution here it definitely uh, is mu it's much more complicated. And the way that a normal diffusion model would construct it as, as the sequence of, of denoising steps. So if we want to do all of it at once, uh, we're going to need basically a more, a more powerful generative model. Yeah, here, here's kind of an example of the problem of that, that you encounter as you try to make your, your diffusion step closer to, or basically if you try to use less diffusion steps. So he, here's, like the, here's this distribution that we start out here. So assume my data kind of looks something like this. And I, as I add more and more Gaussian noise to it, uh, progressively it, it looks more and more this way. Uh, and then the question is, let's try to predict the noise, um, or let's try to predict this, this kind of noise that was added. Uh, and, and you can see that if, you, if you're at the very end, so if, you, if you're diffusing back only one step, the true answer, and in this case we, can, we know the true answer because it's just one dimensional, looks very much like a Gaussian, right? This is, this is a nice Gaussian, we're, we're good. But as we try to jump back more and more steps, uh, the actual true distribution of the data looks more and more shaped. And, and over here, I mean, basically, it looks basically the same as, as our x zero over there. So this is kind of the issue of this, like this Gaussian assumption just does not hold if your step size is too small. So what they propose in this paper is, well, we have powerful generative models. We covered GANs in, in lecture last week. We can use one here. So we're going to swap out this, um, this Gaussian assumption on the reverse distribution with a GAN. Uh, and basically what we want to do is we want this, the discriminator of the GAN to predict or to distinguish between uh, this kind of one-step denoise process given the noise image um, versus the true, the true denoised one. So Q is what, what the data has. We want to we wanna mimic that with the, with the GAN. Uh, and, and kind of there, there, there's a trick here, which is the question is, how do you get Q, right? If, if we knew Q, we, we could just run Q and that would solve our own. That would solve our problem, uh, but in practice, we, we don't actually know Q. Q is actually the, the marginal under the data, uh, but we can sample from it. And so the trick is that this Q distribution right here actually expands out to just be uh, this little marginal right here. So what this equation here is saying is sample an image first, just a regular image, um, and then noise it one step, uh, but then noise, and then noise it one more step. So it's basically saying, like, okay, let's say I have this original image, I'm going to noise it n steps, and I'm going to noise it n plus one steps after that. So now I have this pair, the, the image that's slightly noised and slightly more noised, uh, and that is what we consider the, the true data. So that's the true kind of distribution of, of noise data to slightly unnoised data. So this is the, the objective that we want our discriminator to mark as, as correct. Uh, and then the, object, the examples that are marked as incorrect will be the ones generated by our model. So we're going to train the, the generator uh, by backcropping through the discriminator as, as we usually do in GANs. So again, main idea here is swap out that, that Gaussian prediction of one step with, with a GAN that can produce something that's more expressive. Um, yeah, here's kind of a diagram of, of what the method is doing. It's basically saying, first, let's take the sampled image, and we're going to noise it, and then we're going to noise it a little more. Uh, and now I want my GAN to ba basically predict this version of the image that was slightly less noised, um, uh, which is captured by the discriminator. So the idea is that this process here, because it's modeled by the GAN, can be a lot more expressive of a distribution than the, the one-step Gaussian assumption we had earlier. So here's some examples of, of how it works. Uh, this is with, again, just four diffusion steps. And we can get quite nice high resolution results. So here's some image of, of celebrity faces and of the, the church data set here. Good killing. So I read mm -hmm. this, but was it also trained with just four steps? Um, yeah, it's trained with four steps. So in this paper, the, yeah, yeah, they trained this completely from scratch, this, this diffusion GAN, so that you swap out all of the networks for this. Uh, and, and we're going to see in, in the follow-up paper, you can use the same setup for, for distillation, and that actually 
uh, I think works better. Uh, yeah, so here, here's mobile diffusion. So this is something that came out, I think, less than a year ago, but it introduces a bunch of tricks for speeding up GANs. Sorry, not a couple weeks ago. Uh, earlier this year. Yeah. Earlier last year. Earlier last year. It's, it's very, time moves very fast. Uh, but yeah, so, so I think this paper is nice because it gives us a bunch of tricks for actually how to train uh, diffusion models faster. So if we can just get inference time faster, then sampling becomes a lot easier. And for these guys, they want it to run on your, on your phone. They want it to run locally. So it's important that the parameter count goes down. Uh, so basically, th there's a few architectural tricks that, that, uh, reduce in, that basically can reduce the parameter count. Uh, one of the main ideas is this, um, just put your transformers in the middle of the unit. So we, we talked a little about this before. But the main idea is, if you look at a unit, you start out with images at a very high spatial resolution. So your, your, your input data is maybe, let's call it 128 by 128. Um, and each step, it's, it's collapsing in, in height and width. So maybe at the end here, you're at a latent space of, let's say, 16 by 16. Uh, intuitively, the, the features in the inner layers are more, are more um, compressed. They're more kind of expressive, whereas the features on the outside are more focused on the high frequency details. So it's kind of useful to put your transformers more in the middle, where they can perform the more advanced computation. Uh, and so in, if you had to assign your parameter count, instead of doing it uniformly like we were doing in the past, it's better to put them more in the middle. And that gives us a pretty large efficiency gain uh, without loss of performance. Uh, the other thing that they do here is they decouple the, the self-attention and, and the cross-attention. What this essentially means is in a, in a text-conditioned diffusion model, uh, each layer attends to itself and also the text conditioning. So it attends to basically the global structure and also the, the local structure of the image at the moment. So cross-attention to the text is pretty important. You need that uh, at every layer. Uh, but self-attention, you actually don't need at every layer. And, and in fact, because of the same reason we're, we're in the early and later layers of the unit, your, your spatial resolution is just so big, self-attention takes up a lot of time when you actually you don't need it. So again, cut it out on the, on the outsides and just put it on the inside. Uh, and then there's a few kind of even more uh, architectural details here. We don't have to go too much into them. But there, there are some things we can get away with, which is when you're computing your attention, something you can do is uh, instead of computing your key and your value as two separate heads, you can actually just use one head. And it turns out for, in terms, for diffusion, that's fine. Uh, we can get away with, with merging those and reducing parameter count. Uh, and one thing we can do here is we can get rid of the softmax. So in, in attention, when you compute the attention weighting, you have to you take the dot product between all your key vectors, uh, and then you normalize it by the, the sum of, of all the other dot product. Uh, and you can see that that's kind of annoying, because you have to wait for all the sums to, come by, to, to be done before you can actually compute your weighting. So what they found in this paper is uh, we can train with softmax, which is fine. We have a lot of time to train. Uh, but during evaluation, we want to use something cheaper. And, and they chose Relu here. And it turns out what you can do is you can just fine tune uh, a model that has softmax activations to instead use Relu activations. And that fine tuning process is very cheap. Uh, and then it speeds up. Uh, yeah, the rest of the improvements here are kind of things like reducing widths in the right places, uh, reducing residual blocks, uh, and then using this uh, separable convolutions idea that basically lets you compute the, con the convolution faster. Uh, yeah, and we can see here that here's the original stable diffusion, which has quite a large uh, model size because of the parameter count. Meanwhile, mobile diffusion is able to get it down to something uh, a lot more reasonable. And you can see uh, even in pra like even uh, when you evaluate it, the time it takes to, for each evaluation goes down. So that's kind of two, two avenues of speeding up the diffusion model. One is distilling your, your many-step model down into small steps. And then two is just make each step run a little faster. Uh, and then that adds up. Uh, here's something we're, we're not going to go into too much detail, hourglass diffusion transformer. Uh, but basically, it's a similar idea to this mobile diffusion, where uh, what they do is they, they have this unit where they put more, more transformer parameters near the middle here. Uh, yeah, here's a fun paper because it just came, it just came out uh, two, two days ago, I think. What day is it? But it just came out earlier this week. 
Uh, <laughs> yesterday. Oh, yesterday. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's go over. Let's go see what they do. Uh, yeah, so, so the key idea here is we, we talked about that GAN idea, and we, we noticed how GANs solve the problem where as you, re as you reduce the number of diffusion steps, uh, your Gaussian assumption goes away. So these guys are saying, well, okay, let's do distillation, but let's just use a GAN instead. So instead, let's replace this Gaussian thing with a GAN, um, and this solves the problem of the... Uh, Sorry, this thing. OK, yeah. OK, yeah, the ga so the, the Gaussian is not enough. We need to use something more powerful. In this case, let's use the GAN. Uh, and so how do they do this? Well, they, they do essentially this, the similar thing as, as we were talking about in the, in the other diffusion GAN paper, where this time you use the teacher network as the source of truth. So before we were using uh, kind of noise samples from the data. Here we're just using directly the outputs of the teacher network. So your, um, your discriminator is going to condition on basically uh, this uh, x noised image and then x with, uh, with some, some denoising applied to it. So that's what this x is, is the original image noised, um, and then the, the kind of further denoised version of it. Uh, and here we also make sure, like, we, we tell it the time steps with the amount of noise and also the, the text conditioning here. Um, and then what, one of the nice tricks you can do is if you ever do these kind of distillation things, you can reuse a lot of the weights. So you don't have to train this discriminator from scratch. We actually initialize it um, from the teacher network. So the teacher network already has this uh, encoding portion of the unit. So if you remember, the unit looks something like this. Uh, we can take this part and reuse those weights. And we train the new, the new network over here for use in the discriminator. Uh, here, here's a fun thing. So if your student model has less capacity than your teacher model, which is almost always true, you actually get this kind of mismatch in, in how well you can model uh, the diffusion direction. And, and what's, they, they call this the, the Janus artifacts here uh, after this, like, this multi-headed god, essentially, because one of the ways that this manifests is you end up with pictures like this, where uh, the, the diffusion process essentially tries to, to model uh, exactly what the teacher is doing, but it doesn't have enough capacity to smooth out all the errors. Uh, so you get things like this, where the, the image is very much in distribution of, of possible uh, denoise versions of the image, but as a whole, it's not, it's not correct. So you have, you have things where uh, the head gets split into two. So the way that they solve it in this paper is relaxing this mode coverage assumption uh, is a trick to, to reduce the complexity of the problem. Uh, and they do that by fine-tuning on an unconditional teacher. So the, the, the first problem that they try to, to solve is, is to optimize this value, which is given a noised image, uh, give me the image that's slightly denoised. Uh, but this problem is very hard, and it leads to these ar artifacts. So what they do is they first train this, uh, and then they do this, where this model is not conditioned on XT. It's only saying, just make, uh, just give me denoise images that are probable in general, like among the entire data. Uh, and this actually can solve the, these images, because these images here are not actually probable under the data. Um, so this, this kind of unconditional fine tuning after this first step will solve that problem. Um, here's the details of exactly what they're doing. So the, f the first thing they do is they, they start with this 128-step um, diffusion model. And they actually do the first few steps of distillation with the regular MSC loss. So the, the first progressive distillation paper uh, can get us down to, to 32 without much loss. And it's easier to train. But then if we want to compress it even more, well, now we need to escape this Gaussian assumption and we need to use a more expressive model. That's when we're going to use the, the GAN distillation. So they have these different stages. Uh, and in each stage, what they do is they first do the, the conditional training, uh, conditioned on the original noised image. Uh, then they fine tune to the unconditional to get the, that network. And then they use that network as the teacher for the next network under it. Um, yeah, and then one thing they realize is that you can also use um, LoRa. So LoRa is this basically trick to do, to do fine tuning with lower parameter count. So it's basically this way to, to make a, a low rank approximation of the, the full parameters. 
basically it's it's faster, but it'll it'll give you less expressive results. Uh, but they show in, in this paper that if you're just doing distillation, uh, it's totally fine to actually fine tune uh, these LoRa parameters only, uh, and you get performance that's about about equal to to what they have without it. Uh, yeah, here, here's some results here. So here's an image of a, yeah, a tanned woman dressed in sportswear and sunglasses climbing a peak with the group. Uh, I think none of them actually got the group part, but we're going to see how, how much the, the performance degrades. So this is the original here. This is, um, or this is SDXL, the, the thing that they're going to compare to. Uh, and then here we're, we're fine tuning it from 32 steps down to 8, 4, and 2. Uh, and we can see that yeah, the, the kind of generation quality here at 2 is still pretty expressive. So you still get a lot of the, the detailing. And, uh, and then here, LCM is just a, a different method that they're comparing to. Yeah, so, yeah, so that, that's basically, if, if you want to speed up diffusion models, I think a lot of people are thinking about this recently. Uh, it, there's definitely a lot of unanswered questions there. Uh, mm -hmm. Do they evaluate whether they lose diversity in the process? Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I think we would. We, they probably mention it somewhere in this paper. Um, I, I couldn't give a concrete answer now. I imagine they would. Uh, one nice thing about these these distillation processes is that they try to make sure that the noise to image mapping remains constant. So so you can see here, like even through the the distillation process you're still getting the same type of image from the same initial noise. So because we're doing distillation, that mapping from, from noise to image is, try, is trying to uh, be constant. Mm -hmm. um, so it's linked to the previous question. Um, my question is, uh, with the diffusion band, yeah. um, if you replace, if I understood correctly, you're replacing band with all these steps of the diffusion process, right? Denoising. Yeah, we're trying to replace, like, uh, let's say, many steps of denoising process with a single step of, of the GAN output. If you do so, I remember diffusion um, um, model provides better diversity. So um, if you replace that all the parts, then do you still get that diversity? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think I could give a, a good answer off the top of my head. Although, I. Basically, one rationale for why we want to use distillation instead of training the, the diffusion GAN directly, as the, the second paper did, is that when you do distillation, you're explicitly trying to keep this mapping between noise and generated image, which inherently keeps the diversity that, that the original diffusion model had. So you can say, as long as we got all that diversity during uh, their initial training, we try to, to keep it during distillation. Whereas if you just train the, the scan at first, you might not get it. Uh, yeah, so one other thing we could do with, with diffusion models um, is use them not for generation, but actually just for, for understanding the world. One of the first things we, we, we covered in this unsupervised class, actually, was that a reason that we want to use unsupervised methods is that they, they give us good representation learning. So they, they give us good information about the world uh, without necessarily having to use labeled data. So the question now is, can we use diffusion models for this? And um, here, here we're trying to do, let's see. sorry, let me just, yeah, so, so, so here, here we're trying to, to learn correspondences. So we're trying to learn which parts of images correspond to, to other parts of images. So maybe actually the, these slides should be reordered. Um, we we want to do something like this, where given, the, let's say here they've highlighted the beak of, of the goose here, they want to highlight that same component in other images. So basically, this is a way of learning some sort of semantic information about each image. And the question is, well, we train this diffusion model purely to generate images. Can we actually reuse it to get out something like this? Uh, and the main insight here is the diffusion models are, are trained using noisy images as input. So the diffusion model always takes in some noise version and outputs a, a cleaner version. So if we want to extract features out, 
what we actually need to do is add noise to whatever image we care about. So we need to add some noise to get the image in distribution of the diffusion model. Um, and then we can run that image through, through the model itself. Uh, and here, what they do is they just take out features uh, at a certain layer. So they, they take some layer in the middle of the unit and use those features to compute cosine distance. Uh, and the main idea is, well, we can just take this cosine distance and use that as a metric for how much our semantics match each other. Uh, and this interesting thing is, yeah, as, as your amount of noising changes, uh, the trade-off you get between semantics and details will, will also change. So if you add a high amount of noise, you might get features that correspond to high-level uh, parts of the image, like where an object is. But if you add a small amount of noise, you will, you will get semantics that correspond to finer things, such as texture or color. Um, so this is what they can do using purely a pre-trained diffusion model. They can basically find uh, all these correspondences, and they can, given uh, a labeled part of this image here, they can find that same part on, on all these test images. Um, here's another fun thing you can do. Once you have these kind of semantic correspondences, they, they give you the positional info of, of where features are. So what they do in this paper is they, they took the face and they just added some, uh, they added googly eyes and a stuck out tongue. And they say, let's try to add this in the same place uh, on other images. So this is essentially like a, a zero shot way of, of doing image editing, where if they add it in the original image, then they can add that same feature in, in the semantic location uh, of the other images. Uh, and this just occurs basically without having to fine tune the model. Um, yeah, here, here's another paper trying to figure out how we can extract features from, uh, from a diffusion model. Here we want to do classification. So here we want to use the diffusion model to see like, how well does this correspond to, let's say, a given image night class or even a text label. So we want to classify images. Um, and kind of a, another way to do classification is if we can just learn this distance. So if we can learn a distance between uh, image and text, that's essentially something we can use as, as class label info. Uh, and the main insight here is our diffusion model is, is kind of giving us this model here. So where C is your, your class or your text conditioning, uh, we have this idea of we, we have this distribution over images that match that conditioning. Uh, so if we plug that into Bayes we can get the, the opposite thing. So we can get the, the class condition on image um, as long as we have these marginals here. And if we, if we uh, just assume classes are all uniform, we can actually cross out these numbers, uh, which makes this a lot more tractable to do. So the main idea that, that these guys use is, given uh, this input image here, what they do first is they noise it. So if you want to use it as input to the diffusion model, you need to add some noise first. Um, and then what they do is they diffuse the model where the class, the conditioning is equal to uh, the given class. So, so let's say I'm working with ImageNet. I might try out a uh, bird, car, uh, or truck. Uh, and I would get a different epsilon for each, for each answer. Uh, and then what we want to do here is we just want to compute the distance between this predicted epsilon uh, and the true epsilon that we use to noise the image in the first place. Uh, and then this, the distance between epsilons here is basically the distance uh, between the image and the text. And so now we can compute which class is the most likely just by taking uh, basically which of these distances is the smallest one. So it's a nice way to basically invert the diffusion model and say, OK, if we have a mapping one way from text to images, uh, we can use it in reverse to go from images to text uh, and just find this distance. Um, yeah, here, here's one, one more work on doing kind of representation learning, where here the question is we want to do pixel level segmentation. So we, we want to care about finding semantic maps in an image of which parts correspond to, to certain objects. Uh, so the first thing we can start with is th there's kind of a low resolution uh, hacky way to do it, which they actually start with in this paper, which is let's extract some feature maps. So let's assume we, we pass the image into the diffusion model. We have some features. Uh, we can just use k-means. So k-means is this nice cheap way to do clustering. Uh, if you use k-means on feature space, you would get some semantic correlations between those features. Um, and and one, one kind of nice trick that they use in this paper is uh, if you're using a text condition diffusion model, you want to use your, your query vectors as features, where query is, is the, the query used for cross-attention 
with the text. So in some way, this query vector is meaning like, what do I care about in my text conditioning, uh, which corresponds nicely to what the segmentation should be. So now that we have these kind of low resolution feature maps, we just want to upscale it. So we want to figure out the correspondence from features to the actual pixels in the image. Uh, and the way to do that is we can use this, what they call this modulation strategy, which is that we add this, this constant number to those features uh, and see what, how that affects the generated image. So the idea here is if we had these kind of intermediate features, which, which I'll call Z, and we have the, the rest of the diffusion model, and so the output is X, what we want to do is basically measure how, how Z plus delta maps to a, a new X. Uh, and we want to do Z minus delta and map that to uh, a different X. Uh, and the difference between these two is essentially how much that, that feature uh, affects the corresponding pixel. Here's a visualization of, of how it ends up looking. So given uh, this kind of image here, the low resolution feature maps that they use k-means to find end up being things like this. So you, you have this very uh, pixelated space because it's in low res, uh, but you have some, some kind of uh, starting segmentation map for which things correspond to different items. Uh, and then using the modulation process, we can figure out uh, which pixels actually correspond and with what weighting to those features here. And so if you compose these together, this ends up being uh, our segmentation map. These are some, some final segmentation maps you get if you run this. So again, we, we get a lot of nice um, semantic areas here, like the, the ocean, for example, is segmented differently as the, the shallow water and the beach. Uh, and you have all the people giving us different areas. So I, I think these methods are kind of interesting because they, they show us that we're just trading what we thought was originally an, an image generation model. But actually, by, by solving this reverse diffusion process, it, it has to learn a lot of these features. It has to learn a lot of the, the semantic content. Um, and if we use the right ways to, to get it out, it, it actually contains it. We can get all these, these powerful representations uh, out of the model. Yeah, so kind of as a way to wrap up the lecture, I can talk a little bit about how diffusion models have been used in fields that are, that are not images. Uh, and this, I hope, will open up your, your minds to showing that the, the, the generative modeling we do here, uh, although they've seen a lot of success in images, they can be used very easily in, in, in other applications as well. Uh, Unimat, this is actually work by, by Sherry from, from Berkeley. Um, what's, what is this um, Yeah, they, this, they, they try to use diffusion here for, for material generation. So the idea here is we want to generate these, these structures that, that are likely to, to still stick together in the real world. So in this case, we, have, we can define our, our, our materials as these, these atoms with various x, y, z positions. And the idea is we want to train a generative model over these materials. Uh, and what they do is they just treat basically the, the parameters of these cells as this big um, matrix. And they, they, they can do diffusion over the, the coordinates of each, each, each element. Uh, and here, there, there's kind of an, a nice trick where some elements shouldn't exist. So some elements don't won't exist in the in the final material here. Um, which it's over there. You can't really see it. So this, they use this null location. So they basically just say like uh, materials like or atoms that exist here uh, that we don't want to actually put in the final thing should be mapped to this this area. Um, so so that that is one thing to keep in mind with diffusion is it's. Generally, it's a continuous process, so you do want your, your underlying data to kind of have this continuous uh, representation. And if you have something that's more discrete, you're going to have to use some tricks to, to move it over. Uh, this is a paper that shows that you can use uh, diffusion models to do uh, locomotion planning. So here, here the diffusion process is using the, the xy positions of joints in this uh, simulated robot. Um, and what we're trying to do is predict how the robot will behave uh, as we move into the future. Uh, and then the, the nice thing about diffusion models is we can predict not only how it's going to appear one step in the future, but actually how it'll appear across this entire trajectory. So this whole 
sequence basically becomes this matrix where you have your, your features here, and then you have, you have time over here. And this entire thing can be passed uh, into the diffusion model. So you can see here, like a lot of the joint positions start out in this noise state, which is corresponding to, to that noised image state we looked at earlier. Um, and as you do denoising, they gradually fall into place, uh, and you get trajectories that are a lot more consistent than if you had used a, a one-step trajectory model. <coughs> diffusion policy is also this, this kind of nice application uh, into robotics where we've seen diffusion be applied. Um, and and there, there's kind of this issue when we're doing naive uh, robotic training where let's say we want, to, we want our robot to clone a set of expert demonstrations. Well, usually these demonstrations are actually pretty multimodal. There, there are many ways that a human might solve a problem. Uh, but if you try to capture all these different modes with a single Gaussian policy, um, you end up not being able to fit it. You end up in this problem where uh, you know, if I have a lot of probability mass here and here, then I might model a Gaussian like this, which is, which is not actually matching either of the modes. Uh, but if we define our, our distribution as a, as a diffusion model instead that can model a more complex distributions, we actually get distributions that, that correctly model the actions here. So here, here's one kind of motivating example where you have this blob here that can move uh, either of the two directions. And the diffusion model actually c captures both of these modes and is able to get to, to route the, the robot in the right way, whereas uh, some previous methods might uh, either be messy or it might um, get only one of those modes. Here is uh, an example of how this is looking like in practice. So you would, he here the robot, we're trying to con control the end effector. So we can basically move this, this thing around and we want it to, to push that T to rotate it into the correct position. And so the actions here correspond to what position um, this end tip of the robot should be. Uh, and so basically what we can do is we can just diffuse over all these actions. So starting from noise actions, we're gradually going to move over to the actions that are within the data distribution. And it turns out that this diffusion policy work uh, is a pretty reliable way to do this kind of behavior cloning. And uh, over at this, um, let's see if that's labeled there, yeah, this, the Toyota Research Institute actually, they're using this to, to model a whole bunch of different kinds of behaviors. So they have some videos on the website that will play if you want to look at them. But the main idea is this is actually a pretty scalable way to do some, do some robotic training. OK. Yeah, I think that's, that's kind of wrapping up our, our talk on diffusion models. So there, there's a few more um, links here if you want to check them out in the slides that, that go over in more depth uh, either the derivations or some, some, more, import, some more applications of them. Um, yeah, and if you're interested, there's some kind of advanced topics relating diffusions to, to other aspects as well. Thanks, yeah. Kevin.